And now we are going to hear Anke Tehessen. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce her, who is professor for the history of science at the Humboldt University of Berlin since 2011. And uh, he was awarded also the Abbey Warburg Prize in 2008. Please welcome Hanke Tehessen. Okay, first of all, thank you so much for being here so that it's possible um, to speak to you. I feel very honored about that. And um, in the next course of half an hour, um, I will rarely speak about Warburg, but you will see what the next minutes will bring. When I had to send in my um, title for my talk, month ago, it was hard to know to where I would turn my attention. In the course of rereading Warburg and the early texts that were written about him, it became more and more clear that the kind of exhibition I had in mind is to be seen as a parallel event to the renaissance of the writings of Warburg in the 1970s, especially in Germany. His topics, art and science, high and low, and so forth, and his theories, the psychic roots of mankind and their expressions, were put into the foreground of any humanist and cultural historian at that time. Why was it that Warburg became so important in the 80s and early 90s? What is the context of this fascinating renaissance? First, I will give no, I will not answer these questions, but I will give in the course of the next half hour an observation, one possible explanation beside many, many others. Secondly, I'm not obsessed by turns, but what came into being in the 1970s was a special sort of exhibition, neither contemporary art exhibits nor art historical exhibitions. Those shows I will briefly introduce you to were spatial experiments that tried to unify art and science, high and low, and subjective and objective knowledge. My argument will be that there are three presentations to bear in mind which show this development exemplary. I will start with a detail. The rectangular form and seams of a silver bag ripped open at one end make clear that we are dealing with a casing, an envelopment of some kind. Though slightly crinkled and scratched, the bag retains its lustrous sheen and one can almost imagine an oversized bar of chocolate within. But at a second glance, one notices the label, Les Immateriaux, and the other end of the foil rectangle, the words album and inventory, as well as Centre Georges Pompidou. The center of the bag flaunts a spiral form, which, unlike the imprinted words, resists a clear ascription. Echoing the undulations of the curving figure, the color printed on the silver foil oscillates too. Under changing light effects, the light stone gray is in one moment clearly visible, and in the next moment, is swallowed up by the reflections of the silver foil. Only the promised contents are clearly printed in black, as are the two bars that lead to the back side of the package. And here, one finds the price, the barcode, and the publication number. There is no mistaking now the contents of the package. It has to be some kind of book-like object, which is fittingly presented in such 
a sumptuous, costly manner. That the catalogue to the exhibition Les Immateriaux is the content of for sale is finally made obvious by the reference to the Jean Centre Georges Pompidou. The silver, lavishly coated foil was the latest trend of the 1980s. With its futuristic appearance, more appropriate for space travel than for exhibition catalogues, it demanded attention. It evoked Andy Warhol's silver clouds, which weren't intended for use, but rather were designed to celebrate one thing above all, glamour. The flashy material of the pop icon had taken hold of Paris exhibition venues. Les Immateriaux thus gave the impression of a newly packaged event with a generous dash of pop. Before a global ecological consciousness brought an end to such expensively produced packaging, the exhibition team decided to place the catalog on the market in form of a consumer good and a glittery space treasure. Both material and image attested to the pr product being sold. The printed logo appeared as a label on the books as well as on the posters of the exhibition and suggested a stylized, incomplete print of a fingertip. Lines of irregular width run parallel into a spiral form and then out of it again. It invokes both a fleeting sign and a trace. It captures the already vanishing and the not yet present. The remains of a fingerprint stylized here as a trace mark a movement within the four borders of the sparkling packaging and represent the opposite of a goal-oriented path with a beginning and an end. The silver foil and the fingerprint co coalesce into a union that points to the new in the old. It does not suggest a simple reversal but indeed a change in direction. The exhibition Les Immateriaux took place in Paris from March to July 1985 at the Centre Georges Pompidou and was curated by the philosopher Jean-Francois Lyotard and the design theorist Thierry Chaput. Its aim was no less than to express the postmodern condition in three dimensions and to consider in that space how art and science and philosophy could be captured through new technologies of communication. The curator's hands understood materiality not necessarily as immaterial, so much so as they questioned the modern conception of materiality and brought its plural manifestations to the fore. Therefore, it is hardly surprising that the curators attached great importance even to the catalogue and its design. Parts of the catalogue were designed as loose leaves to break up the linearity of a bound book. Other parts were composed by multiple authors, yet the catalogue in its entirety was initially presented as a sealed package. Similar to the concept of the multiple, the catalogue epitomized the commodity character of objects, the consumability of knowledge, and its simultaneous proximity to pop. The stacks of shrink-wrapped catalogues constituted in the truest sense of the word a product of the cultural industry. Les Immateriaux was an exhibition in the 80s that attended to the new possibilities of knowledge, temporarily limited, incorporating many actors, dependent on technological conditions, and in contrast to modern progress-oriented thought, non-linear, the exhibition at the Centre Pompidou attempted to translate a new visibility of science and knowledge into spatial terms. In its rooms, visitors encountered artworks and objects, simulations, 
screens and computers prompting sensory impressions. The exhibition was therefore both a presentation venue and spatial metaphor for the new postmodern knowledge. For Lyotard, knowledge can no longer be understood teleologically as a homogeneous block, rather knowledge splinters into plural bases which are occupied by numerous different actors. The exhibition refuses to navigate the visitors. Instead, visitors are allowed to find their own way through the exhibition to experience the space as a net which interlinks their points and traverses their tangled path and to fathom new combinations through the juxtaposition of diverse collections. Such presentation movements can be designated as emancipatory movements, breaking away from text and relying on the simultaneity of associative visual impressions. Les Immateriaux should therefore be understood as a specific type of exhibition which had its roots in the 1970s, took on its characteristic forms in the 1980s, and broadly established itself in the 1990s. This kind of exhibition aimed at uniting art and science, aesthetics and practice, sense and intellect. It attempted to implement theory through aesthetic means and thus encourage visitors to comprehend the exhibition in connection with their own lives. It was not a coincidence that this undertaking involved addressing the topic of the human psyche. Theorists like Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari, Michel Foucault and Jean-François Lyotard, and exhibition makers like Harald Seemann and Jean Claire were united in their interest in the potential of the human psyche and its relationship to the preceding era of modernity. Which conditions of life make liberation possible? How could the human psyche, shaped by modernity, be translated into a new, emancipated sensory appara apparatus of postmodernity? Similar to the contemporaneous theoretical experiments, which sought to fuse image and text into an amalgam, here too stood the epistemic potential of aesthetics at issue. The exhibition formed a concentrated side of sensory visual, visual possibilities. These possibilities were examined while it was asked at the same time how to progressively achieve its best realization. To this end, it was necessary to reflect on the foundations of modernity, on the exertions taken on by the human psyche to shape itself so that it could keep up with the bygone age of machinery. When Harald Seemann opened his exhibition, Junggesellenmaschinen, the bachelor machines, and here you see the cover of the catalog, and in the coming pictures, I will not show you the exhibition because that would need much more time to explain the pictures. So I give you the covers of the catalog. So when Harald Seemann opened his exhibition, Junggesellenmaschine, the Bachelor Machines, in the Bern Museum of Art in July 1975, not only did he focus on visualizing a literary myth, but also on exploring the bourgeois capitalist, predominantly male subject's relationship to love and sexuality. Seemann emphatically tread a new path by conceptualizing the artworks at the center of the exhibition with <coughs> documents from the sciences. In so doing, he attempted to give a scientific foundation of the obsession with the infertile sexual machinery. The art historian Peter Gorsen, writing about Seemann's concept, 
claimed that its particularity lay in its emphasis on the significance of the bachelor machine within the philosophical psychiatric discussion. Gorsen, furthermore, refers to Deleuze and, and Gattery when suggesting that the potential sex drive suppressed by the industrial production simultaneously act, acts as the productive libido that comprised the foundation for production. And he said, capitalism produces its own contradictions. Exhibitions, as Gorsen made clear in his commentary, could and should therefore take on the charge of critiquing ideology. In taking up this task, Seemann relied particularly on sensory mediation. And I quote, the most important myth of the bachelor machine should therefore be sensualized and put into optical perspective. The relevance of this translation work, however, needs to be conveyed concurrent to the optical experience. In other words, the implicit socio-critical dysfunctional attitude needs to be made explicit when addressing these myths. Whether this can be achieved with the instruments of an exhibition alone, I am unable to say." End of quote. That Seemann strived to combine a political position with a new form of knowledge in his exhibition is underscored by his closing words. It is the gamble of such exhibitions to see whether knowledge could be translated into event value, Ereignis wert. This cannot be planned to be sure, so Seemann, yet the exhibition certainly can be experienced and seen in multiple layers. The exhibition wants to demonstrate that nowadays intentions and behavior are the actual goal and not ready-made products. The exhibition as a forum for discussion and a mode of sensory knowledge, this was the program of the spatial juxtaposition of art and science. It depended on proliferating associations and sought to spur these by hanging the exhibits like pieces of evidence, or what Seemann called evidence hanging. Artworks placed next to books, books next to texts, and sculptures next to machines. Duchamp's ready-mades were related to the fantastical apparatuses of science fiction films. The machine from Kafka's panel colony was shown as a three-dimensional model and presented in a spatial sequence with photographs of spiritualist sessions or of the allegorical achievements of industrialization at the world expositions. Within Seemann's cosmos, Art and science were understood in conjunction with one another because they were equally characterized by industrial production and because only through their fusion could the obsessive nature of man and its manifestations be made clear. The Junggesellenmaschinen preceded Les Immateriaux. Their ambition was political. They were intended to trigger a critical shift of consciousness with respect to previous understandings of subjectivity. Ten years later, in Paris, it was less the goal for politically explosive force and more so the ambition to turn the intellectual history of men upside down. The singular subject had turned into many actors and his potentialities were multiplied. Another four years later, in Vienna in 1989, the exhibition Wunderblock, Freud's mystic writing pad, historicized the human psyche through a consistent parallelization of art and science. This time, however, this was presented as a new history of the soul 
as claimed by the exhibition subtitle, a history rewritten in accordance with postmodern theory. The show was opened in April 1989 on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of Sigmund Freud's death and was curated by Jean Claire, Katrin Pichler and Wolfgang Pircher. Jean Claire had already participated in the Junggesellenmaschinen and Pichler acknowledged the precursor's curatorial efforts. I quote, this exhibition raises the questions on the genesis of the modern consciousness and thus finds itself in the tradition of Harald Seemann's Junggesellenmaschine and Jean-Francois Lyotard Les Immateriaux, two exhibitions that dared to confront the self-conception of modernity and attempted to locate its genesis in the reciprocal relationship between the natural sciences and artistic imagination of the 19th century." End of quote. Once again, it was about art and science. This time, however, with a slight shift in perspective. The psychical is handled less from the viewpoint of one affected or involved and more so from a historical perspective. It was no longer a critique of ideology and instructions for new drafts, but rather a distance, distanced comparative treatment. No longer guidance for a new consciousness, but rather a recapitulation of a historical development. If the idea of interlacing artworks with scientific objects was, for Seemann, still part of an attempt to actively change the world, the Wunderblock exhibition postulated the existence of multiple varied narrative threads on the psyche, the brain, and the subject, and established these as one of many meta-narratives on man. Psychoanalysis was put into context with mesmerism. Phrenology was juxtaposed with fin de, with fin de siècle art and the physiognomic oriented experiments from Franz Xaver Messerschmidt to Theodore Géricault and in his catalog text, X Stroke in the Mind, Jean Claire begins with the rhetorical question. What is the point of uniting so many different things in a place which we call exhibition? Can we place works which we refer to as works of art side by side with scientific instruments or even with objects like Mesmer's strange machineries, which almost no one today knows how to operate? In a manner much more careful, than the stormy rhetoric of Seemann and his peers in the 1970s, Claire approaches the traditional fields of high art and individual scientific communities as a system of references. The curator Claire explicitly addresses the critique of such an interdisciplinary approach only to immediately reject it. According to critiques, while the one exhibition visitor would be robbed of her intellectual curiosity, since there is apparently nothing to learn here, the other would be disturbed in their pure enjoyment of an artwork. But, says Claire, in reality, things are a little bit more complicated. After all, as Claire makes unmistakably clear, Art and science can no longer rely on their former self-evidence. They too need to reconstitute themselves in the new age of postmodernity. And I quote, considering the great epistemic confusion that characterizes postmodernity, it is necessary to swim against the stream back to the beginnings, back to that which originally conceived of the soul as unique to mankind and placed it at the center of our attention after man had, in the wake of 1789, stopped listening to God. Claire's essay makes clear 
the multiperspectival or the rhizomatic readings that sounded so promising in the mid-1970s were now subjected to an integrative assessment that placed the history of knowledge at the center of its inquiry in order to gain new perspectives for future treatment of the topic. The old vocabulary for such call to action remained intact, swimming against the stream. Yet the new goal was to mark the origin and trace the steps of development. It addressed beauty in its different forms. It aimed at gathering explanations from science and from art and putting these jointly into play. Historicization and aestheticization now went hand in hand and were scrutinized in light of a possible future of enlightenment, like Hans Robert Jaus called it. If one was no longer occupied with the supremacy of reason and the comprehensiveness of the encyclopédie, how then could one enhance the critical potential for aesthetic development? Claire answer to this challenge was first to localize the fields of knowledge, to loosen their classic disciplinary borders just enough, far enough so that new fields of inquiry could emerge and thus consolidate into a history of knowledge. This point was elaborated in the preface to the catalogue, the convergence of art and science of the supposedly subjective and objective is among other reasons possible because science is increasingly understood as an image, as pictorial, and vice versa, art is experienced as the stage of ideas. Hence, sensory experience, according to the preface, still was to be combined with the event value demanded by Seemann and contained within it the seed for a future history of knowledge. <coughs> to conclude, exhibitions spanning multiple fields of knowledge were established in the 1980s. The juxtaposition of diverse objects from art and science stabilized itself as a tool of presentation and an ever-growing public marveling at the exhibited relations between these domains. While the Junggesellen machine still built upon the assumption that it could represent a political, aesthetic forum and Les Immateriaux postulated for the first time a new kind of knowledge, the Wunderblock historicized these impulses in the process of their establishment. The once political motivated juxtaposition intended to be used as a bodily source of knowledge was increasingly depoliticized and established as a new alternative narrative approach. The activating constellations of objects were made into fields of association upon which new narratives unfolded. And what about the packaging? It demonstrates that the aesthetization of the diverse domains of knowledge was not only implemented in the programmatic spatial arrangement of the exhibition, but also into the glittering consumer culture. The wrapping around the catalog of Les Immateriaux points to a leveling process in 1985. Just as the borders between art and science were to be leveled, so too were pop culture and high culture, glamour and content to be united. The old tool of a catalog was now sold in disposable packaging. The crisscrossing movement of the contents cannot be better summarized. Knowledge, since the 1980s, is allowed to shine. Thank you. <laughs>